to today's webinar. Thank you, Rebecca. So we will start recording the webinar so everyone has access to the webinar later. Uh, I'm Stephanie Garcia with the Broward Metropolitan Planning Organization, and today we will present an overview of the program and, of course, more specific information about what tactical urbanism is. And I'm here with Tony Garcia. He is our tactical urbanism expert and team lead to, that is helping us implement this program here in Broward. So first, I would like to start with general information about the program. Uh, this program was established in 2020 and it was a follow-up of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Action Plan uh, actions uh, identified. So we wanted to implement this uh, tactical urbanism program in order to help municipalities implement faster some innovative projects here in Brava region. And thank you, thanks to the MPO board, in, in October uh, 2021, we were able to continue this program and we decided to implement the second pilot project uh, in 2022. As most of you know, the first pilot project is happening right now in the city of Deerfield Beach and is going to be ready by December, the first week of December. If you're interested in, in you know, learning more about it and even in participating, you can contact me and I will provide more information. But today we are going to focus in 2022, right? So. The, the corporate project is open. Uh, I think uh, everyone has uh, this link to access the, the submission of projects. If you don't have the link yet, just let me know and I will send you the link. The deadline is November 15. And what we are looking for is actually uh, identify what would be the second pilot project for the didactical program. And this is, is the criteria that we are going to uh, identify and well that will help us identify what the second pilot project would look like. So first I would like just to mention that for us it's really important that the project that, that you will submit it is identified in an existing plan. It could be a city plan, a master plan, it could be even a study and of course if, it, if the project is already identified within the bundled areas uh, established uh, in the computer master plan. Something else that we want to see is, is the project is overlapping or intersecting the Broward High Injury Network. This high injury network actually is showing the concentration of collisions where this happened in our transportation network. So we want to make sure that we checked, you know, uh, these safety measures and we actually working on a project that will improve safety and will it reduce the number of crashes in, the, in that specific area. Something else that we are going to take in account when selecting the project or prioritizing this project will be roadway jurisdiction. So is this project in a local road, in a county road or a state road? And why is this important for the MPO? Because we need to know a, we, who are the partners that we're going to work with. So if it's a, a county road, then we have to work with the county involve the county since the beginning and the city will help us do that. Same thing with DOT. If we have a state road, then we have to work with DOT in order to make this possible. Land use. So this criteria is also key. Why? Because we want to know if your project is in an area where there are schools or hospitals or uh, groceries, uh, uh, shops, or anything that will move a uh, high volumes of pedestrians or traffic. We need to know why you identify this project and why it's so relevant for you and your community. So after we identify and we prioritize this list of projects, we will choose just one project, at least for 2022. And how this will look like for the city or the partnering city. So the partnership is a collaborative, collaborative approach. The idea is that we are going to work as a team, the MPO, of course, a street plus collaborative, and the city in order to make this possible. So what we are going to offer through, through a street plans is technical assistance. So we are going to come up with the project evaluation, with the, stakeholder, the stakeholders coordination, with a walking audit, the first walking audit in order to explore the corridor and of course involve the community and collect their feedback. We're going to also uh, uh, um, 
have public meetings in order to present the progress of the project uh, uh, till the installation of the project as well and the conceptual plan. We will also come up with a conceptual plan. This is the designs of the intersection or bike lanes or uh, your project in specific. The installation checklist, the pre build and build, the on site management and operation, and also we will measure uh, the changes of the, the project, you know, the before and after. But I will let Tony Garcia to tell us a little bit more about this because I know he has a great presentation. <laughs> and partner agency, right? So, as I mentioned before, this is a collaborative approach. So, we are expecting also some work from the municipalities. We are expecting, of course, you know, the coordination within the different departments, public works, and the public outreach department as well, or communications. We also expect, you know, the uh, uh, this designation of a city coordinator, that person will be working together with us, with the MPO and street plans in order to make this possible. We will also request, you know, applying for permits or any other things that we need in order to implement this pilot project in your city. How this will look like, you know, talking about timeline, right? So we are expecting to select a project by the end of November. So the city that we choose or the project that we choose will receive news, great news, by the first week of December. And from them, the idea is to schedule the first working audit in January, February, depending on, of course, the availability and capability of the city, because again, this is something that we're going to do together. So we're gonna be you know, working on your schedule. And we are planning to have this project implemented by May. Why May? Well, May is, you know, has a beautiful weather and uh, we have, you know, just this uh, number of months to implement this project because we want this project to be quick. Uh, and again, uh, just wanted to mention that the corporate pro for projects is open. And if you have any questions specific to your submission, you can contact us before November 15 and we can help you out with, you know, those uh, doubts or questions that you have. And I will turn it over to Tony Garcia so he can talk, uh, talk about Tactica Urbanism and more detailed information about the implementation and the planning and implementation of the pilot project in 2022. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm gonna bring up my presentation here. Uh, I think you covered a lot of, of some of what I'm gonna say, but I'm gonna say it again, because I think uh, the more that we re reinforce some of these items, the better. Um, uh, as Stephanie said, I'm Tony Garcia. I'm uh, an architect. I'm actually local to South Florida. I'm, I'm based out of Miami, but the majority of work actually is is all around the country. Uh, we have an office also in, in Brooklyn, in New York, and we do transportation planning. And really, the work that we do for tactical urbanism and in tactical urbanism in, is in service uh, of our, our transportation plan. So we do the technical drawings, reports, all the standard sort of normal transportation planning um, type of work. And then also all the, the cool fun building elements and everything you see here are projects that, um, that we built personally with, you know, either I was there painting or, or my team installing delineators and, and spraying the, the pavement with, uh, you know, traffic marking tape or, or with beautiful art. So we have extensive experience in this. We've documented this all around the world and, and have done numerous studies uh, for transit, for asphalt art, for the different types of materials. Um, and so this is something that, that um, gets to the core of our work and, and our, our ethos as urban planners. So you're in good hands with, with our team. We know how to do this work and, and how to make the project shine and how to make you shine as well. Um, so most of the time in our work, we're actually, as I said, we're transportation planners. So we do renderings like this, where we are always looking to uh, sort of rebalance our transportation system and, and reallocate space from cars to pedestrians. We firmly believe that our streets have been overbuilt for cars and our, our transportation network has been overbuilt for cars. So that is a core philosophy of ours that we should be doing more of this, right? And this is not only for pedestrians, this is for for bicyclists. Um, and most often than not, and, and many of you will, will know this experience, you're faced with a very angry public or, or even um, fellow elected officials 
or staff who don't understand how this vision will work. Either they don't agree with it philosophically, or there's not any political will to do this, or something else. And so our, our mission, the reason that we do this work, tactical urbanism, is to try to communicate with, with a public that is not um, ready for or doesn't understand how this is going to benefit them. And so we look at the example of New York City as, as being the, the really most clear-cut, um, elegant example of tactical urbanism in action because it goes from a very short-term, what was intended as a, as a test, all the way to full-scale construction and final design. Um, and this is the example of Times Square in New York City. Uh, and so this is a, a project that had been on the books for many years. Their MPO had a, a plan from the 1960s to convert Broadway to a pedestrian way. Uh, and that, that plan just sat on the shelf for decades until Mayor Bloomberg and Jeanette Sedekan came along and said, let's try this out, let's test it. And so they did a, what was intended to be a three-day test uh, around Labor Day of, of, um, of 2009, no, Memorial Day. Sorry, I always get those confused. Memorial Day of 2009. I happened to be there coincidentally and, you know, really was shocked and, and inspired by that work that was so successful. And that was just sort of Kmart chairs and traffic bollards and not anything, not any heavy investment at all. Um, and that was only supposed to be for, for that weekend, but it was so successful that they left it up. And over time, they incrementally made improvements to the type, the quality of the furniture, the, the types of, of bollards and delineation. And also they, they laid out some asphalt art, um, and all the while they were doing data collection and realizing that there was benefits for safety for all modes. Traffic didn't get any worse in Midtown Manhattan than it already was. And retail sales improved. Um, so there was all, these, all, the, all this evaluation that went into it that reinforced the fact that it was a good project and also led to some changes. You know, they did tweak things about it. Uh, and then they hired an architect to do a rendering, to do a rendering and a design, which they then completed in 2016. Um, and I, I'd like to say, and I think it's the most powerful way of showing this example, that if they had started with the rendering um, of, the, of, of a closed Times Square to cars and a pedestrian plaza, we would still be talking about the rendering today than how wonderful and beautiful and elegant that space is. And that's really the, the disruptive power of tactical urbanism in action as it relates to infrastructure and the design of our cities. It allows us to break the, the red tape and break political and, and public stalemates to actually test out what we want to see and see if that's really what we want. And so when we talk about this term tactical urbanism, we say that it's an approach that uses short-term low-cost materials for long-term change. This is not just about getting something quickly done and inexpensively. It's about the longer term vision. So I'll, I'll go back to this in, in, in a few minutes, but think about what your long term play is as a city or, or a city leader. Do you have funding for a long term capital improvement project that you want to test out? Do you have a plan that has already been vetted? So think about this work in the context of the broader efforts that you already have going on, whether they're in the future or, or have already happened. Um, and when we think about these projects, some of the basic criteria or not criteria, but characteristics are um, that they are inexpensive. We're, we're not talking about real dollars here. I mean, comparatively speaking, we might spend $100,000 on a project and Deerfield's the project that the first B tactical project is uh, a six figure project. But in the scale of the work that we do as transportation planners and, and policymakers, that's a drop in the bucket um, when that project is gonna end up being millions of dollars to reconstruct the street. <laughs> these projects are not permanent. And so they can be temporary in terms of a day, but they can also be temporary in terms of the materials are not expected to last for more than three or four years. And that means what is the, that, that requires you to be thinking about always, what is the next step? How do we, how do we make these materials longer lasting or what is the, gonna be the next iteration of this project? Um, we also find that, that it's important to, to put these projects in context. They are based on existing plans, or at least they should be. This is not about guerrilla urbanism, although I support that. I think people should, be, should take more ownership and license of, of their streets and public spaces. But in the context of this program, we're talking about 
implementing projects that, that you studied and thought about already or have it have an interest in studying further. And finally, we bring people into the mix. So this is not about having a public meeting on a Wednesday night in a cafeteria somewhere where um, we don't really have a flexible and transparent engagement. This is about doing that plus actually getting people out into the world to build the infrastructure to show us how it's used to see if it works for them or not. And, and in doing things, the public learns and so do we. When we talk about tactical urbanism, there's this whole range and nomenclature associated with the work. Um, and in the context of the work that we do as transportation planners, we say this is about breaking, breaking down project delivery. Too often, and, and most of 99% of the work that's out there still, goes straight into the, the long-term capital plan, which is a five-year to 10-year thing. It's not something, the project delivery process as it is right now is not meant to accelerate projects. But what happens is you spend a lot of money and time and political energy working towards the permanent thing that is really far down the road where you can get something in the ground right now, whether it's a demonstration project, that one day to one month long uh, increment, or pilot projects, which is really where we are for this project, one month for one year. Um, and that's not a hard edge that one year. So that, that just means that the materials will start to decay faster after that one year. But all this means is there are different sort of phases to this work that relate back to the quality of the materials. So the materials that we would use for a demonstration project are different than what we would use for a pilot project because there's a different expectation. For a demonstration, you want those materials to, to wash away after a day or two, but for a pilot project, you don't. So at each step, you, there's a different expectation with regard to review, with regard to public involvement. So when it comes to interim design, we don't have the public go out and pour concrete and, and um, paint with thermoplastic and, and more heavy duty materials. But with a demonstration project or even a pilot project, we would. So there's an increasing amount of investment that goes into each phase. And there's also an increasing amount of political capital and public support that, that goes into each phase. And presumably if you go through this whole process, like the, the Times Square example, you're actually learning at each phase and there's things that are not gonna work. They're gonna fail spectacularly. And you learn from those to get to the next phase and your permanent project is going to be better for it rather than having skipped all these steps and just jump into permanent and really cross your fingers and make and hope that the project works out the way that you wanted it to. So just to summarize this whole idea of practical urbanism is why we do this work. And for me, as, as a person who's I've been doing this since I was in my late 20s and I just I turned 41 this year, um, I want to expedite the delivery of public benefits faster. We should not be waiting for these projects. They can be done much faster and, and to greater benefit. Um, and they're also a way for us to get existing master plans implemented. We spend a lot of money and, and our MPOs in particular spend a lot of money on master plans that sit on a shelf. And sometimes that's okay because not all master plans are made equal and some of them are better than others, but we wanna be able to implement those plans. I, I mean, at least I, as an urban planner, didn't get into this business just to create documents that didn't do anything. Um, and it really, I think, centers people in the work and gets them back into uh, a decision-making role where they haven't been in a long time, if ever, in our modern metropolitan cities. And we learn a lot from them when we, when we do that. You also find that people who would otherwise be opponents of projects, and who come to our meetings and are very upset about the plans that we do, when we involve them in the creation of the work, it completely changes their entire view of the work. And they might still be critical of the things that, that are built, but the fact that they're involved and they got to see the decision-making process changes how they interact with, with the public, with, with their fellow um, citizens, and also with decision-makers. So now I'm gonna go through uh, sort of a summary of the hypothetical process. And all of this gets tailored to whatever the specific context is and, and, and you, your capacity on the ground in terms of the city's schedule and, and all that. But this is a typical condition. And I, I, I started to tag it to and, and align it with our schedule because it's pretty set. We need to have something in the ground by May, which is a totally doable um, trajectory. But if you look at this, we start off in January with vetting our concepts, starting with our our, um, our uh, public outreach 
just understanding who's on the ground, getting those base maps made and understanding what the issues are. Then we move into February, March, really doing design development that goes from zero to 60 really fast. We go from um, conceptual design to uh, basically construction documents in, in two and a half months. By mid-April, we should have our construction documents pretty finalized and set and in whatever permit ready form you need. Um, and that's something that, that I'm gonna go back to in a moment in terms of the permits. And then in April, we would be acquiring our materials. We usually wanna acquire materials a month in advance. We'll have to evaluate come February where we are with materials nationally, given the, the sort of um, supply chain shortages that, that have actually hit our field in particular because of paints and, and plastics that are coming from different parts of the world. And then finally, we'll do the, the installation in May. And so that's volunteer coordination and, and actual execution. So a little bit more about, about each of these steps. Um, not all public engagement is, is made um, equal and, and we will tailor whatever that engagement is to your, your community and what you think the needs are. Um, so that might mean some virtual, uh, it might mean leaning more heavily on in-person now that we're we're sort of uh, in, a, in an area that we can do that in a time when we can do that. We have to go out and, and walk the corridor and walk, or not the corridor, whatever the site is, with the people who are using it. Like these are photos from our Deerfield, um, our, the process that we're going through right now. So I know I knocked the public meetings at the community center, the, the cafeteria, but we do have to do that. Um, and so we'll organize that, we'll create all the maps, all the, the collateral material that you'll need, um, and then work with the community to actually figure out what that looks like. Oftentimes we'll also suggest establishing a, a community action committee or some sort of a, a group that is made up of city staff and very involved community members where you have that um, sort of energy because having those people on the team are is, is a great way of, of building support because later on when you actually go out and implement this project you're going to want community members to be empowered to defend the work and to really own it and, and you know here are just some examples of what we get out of those out of those public meetings um th these don't look like much to you all maybe but they're very instructive for us and we actually internalize a lot of this and and make it into the drawings. And then we'll go back to the public and we'll say, is this what you meant? And if it's not, we'll change it around. And so that's why we we insist on going back and forth several times. I think um, the original scope for this, for our first phase was only to have one public meeting and we're gonna enter into our third public meeting. And I, we do that because the final project is strengthened and is better the more often we go to the public uh, and, and ask them if, if and check in with them, just make sure that, that we got things right. Second very important element of this is, is this materials budget and our project budget. For this work, for this grant, um, we have a budget of $30,000. That's gonna come out of, out of our scope and, and, and the MPO's um, sort of commitment to the project. If you have a matching amount, that's great. But I think with $30,000, given the scale of where we're working, and I'll get to the scale in a minute, we're in good shape. That's, that's a reasonable amount of money. We are very transparent with how we make decisions. So it might be that we start off the project with a bunch of project elements. And once we start putting pen to paper and, and actually doing this analysis and seeing how much the paint costs and the stencils or whatever it is that we're working with, we might have to start to edit that plan. So it's a back and forth between the plans and also this budget. After, and, I, and in parallel with that budget, we're developing plans and, and there's a bunch of different um, components to these plans. They're the site plans. Those are our permit documents. They lay out all the dimensions, the signage, where everything goes, the types of materials. These are your permit documents. They're, they're really not any different than, than normal construction documents, except for the fact that, um, you know, they, they're for uh, pedestrian and, and bicycle improvements rather than, you know, buildings or other things. Uh, we also have other, other plans that we can develop as part of this work, depending on what the need is, that is re related to um, the installation. So depending on what it is that we're installing, if, if there is a, an artistic component, we have to have a whole other sort of uh, guiding document for that that explains what we're doing. We do have a build schedule. So typically this work is done over the course of one to five days. We really don't want it to stretch over 
longer than that, because then that's a different scale of project. That's not a tactical project. Um, so what we'll do is outline by day who's doing what. So Stephanie is in charge of all of the striping for this component. And we'll explain in, in half an hour and an hourly increments who's doing what and what everybody should be doing. Somebody from Street Plans or the MPO will be there to lead components of the project. But we also rely on, on city staff heavily to help with, with execution and also the public. We want the public to be involved in building these, these, um, these projects. So here's just an example from Deerfield, from this, the project that we're doing right now of the site plan that is guiding the development of the striping. So this, this is a little bit more complex than, than what we're asking for this second phase for the, for the call this grant period, um, because it, it involves a corridor that's a mile long and multiple intersections. Uh, but you can see that there's removal of, of existing pavement markings, there's new pavement markings, new striping, and then there's an artistic component to it. So, and, and signage to boot. And all of this is MUTCD compliant, where we are deviating for them from that for a good reason, we will say so and we'll negotiate that and talk to you about it and, and figure out what works and doesn't work. We want to get to a positive project and, and, and an approval that works. So that's that's our, our you know methodology when it comes to permitting and just um, getting these projects in the ground. Evaluation is also a really important component of this. One thing I didn't mention at the beginning was we always look to the evaluation to help figure out what worked and didn't work. And we, you all, as well as we, go into this work knowing that things are going to fail. Things are going to go wrong, and it's okay. That's We thrive off of that failure because it informs what happens next. If everything goes great, that's awesome. But we also have to be honest about what works and doesn't work, and part of that is evaluation. We listen to folks, and if somebody says, you know what, this is a really nice idea, but, for example, we did a project in Akron, Ohio, where we did a, a two-way bike facility on a street. And it kind of checked all the boxes, many boxes. But one of the really um, sort of thoughtful comments that we got was, this is a really great project, but the bike lane is almost unusable because of the potholes and all of the, the condition of the pavement. This needs to be addressed. And we knew that going into it, but having the city see that really lit a fire under them and they were able to add up are things that that result from the results um, that can help the project and that's just one anecdote to to the to the evaluation plan component but this will be counts pedestrian counts bicycle counts crashes speeds uh, and it's really dependent on also your resources do you have data collection that's that's automatic that's awesome if not we have to figure out a solution and then finally, thinking about maintenance and removal. Do you want, how, how temporary do you want this project? Do you want it in the ground for a long time? Um, do you wanna have it removed? Cause then we have to figure that in, factor that into the budget and really think about it. Uh, paint fades fast in our, and especially in our climate, it's baking and, and under the sun and, and the constant water and also people driving over things. So we, we think about that and depending on what your long-term goals are, we can help establish a plan for either removal or maintenance. But keep in mind that these elements are gonna be the city's responsibility. You're, you will be responsible for maintaining this work. So that, that will fall outside of the, the sort of division between what the grants and the MPO's responsibilities are and what the city's responsibilities are. And ultimately we're, we wanna have fun. This shouldn't be a, a drag. It shouldn't be something that you're doing just for the sake of doing it. We should have a project that's fun, that addresses a need, and, and where you have some champions on the ground that are gonna be there with us. We shouldn't be forcing this down anybody's throat. Uh, so think about that when you're choosing a project um, so that you know we, we have a good time while we're doing this work. Uh, okay, so I see some questions, but I, I wanna get through this. Um, and I actually, what is the recommended size and length? And this is actually germane to what I'm about to talk about. Because our, our time frame is between January and, and, and it's really from December to, to May, but I, I, December with the holidays, I just, I find it to be a lost month for a lot of reasons, but um, 
we have to get something in the ground in May. So we're not going to be able to do a very long project. Uh, and in fact, that Deerfield example was a project that they applied for a crosswalk. And in doing the field review, we saw that there were there was an, a bike lane, that there was enough room to create a protected bike lane. And, and so that's just the way that our method works is, is we kind of pull at the, at the thread to see where it takes us. And, and however big the project becomes is how big it becomes as long as we have enough budget for it and it's within a time frame that's realistic. For Deerfield, that worked. For you guys, for this second round, that's not going to work. We're going to have to be kind of strict about keeping it around an intersection or a, a couple of small things that, that are close together. You don't want to spread interventions out too far. And I'm going to go into some examples of, of what the interventions that we're looking at uh, for this round. Um, and just to give you an idea, but before I get into that, let me walk, walk you through, I think, some, some initial criteria for you to think about in terms of scale and length and just your involvement. Um, you should be involved. You should expect that this is going to be a major project for you. You're going to spend a lot of time, and especially in the compressed timeline, we lean heavily on city staff. This is not the sort of thing that you apply for the grant and you know we we award you the grant and then it's like okay stephanie and tony go for it that's not going to happen that that cannot happen because we're not empowered to do work in your city we don't know all the players we're not going to be able to get approval for anything um and so it's going to take considerable staff time know that going into this so that it's not painful during the process it's going to be this is a major project um and then also it's not just a major project for you I know that that um, you know there's gonna, there's probably a lot of transportation planners or planners on the call. You need to check in with your engineering department and your public works. They need to be on board because even though they're not the applicant, they are the applicant. The ultimate decider of what happens on these projects is going to be public works or your engineering department. So they need to be in the decision making process. That's part of of this all being fun and, and collaborative is everybody going into it with eyes wide open. Um, Number two is political and public support. Do you have a political champion that, that is going to back you up? When we, if we have all the stars aligned, let's say we've got your, your, um, you, we've got your engineer support, we've got funding, we've got a great project idea. Um, do you have someone that at, at a political level, the mayor or, or, or your council, majority of your council, supporting this concept? Because what you don't want is to go out on a limb on a, for a project that may or may not work, that is going to rile people up. There's always, I've never done a project, no matter how um, warm and fuzzy it makes people feel, there's always somebody or, or a group of people that, that arise that are angry about this work. And that's a totally different conversation that we can have another day that has to do with cynicism about government and, and the current state of our, of our body politic. But there is always going to be people, and, and probably you all know this, that are against the work that we're doing, even without even knowing it, um, even before they know what the concepts are. And that's happened to us. We have an introductory public meeting and people come out against whatever it is that we're doing, even though they don't even know anything about what we're doing because we haven't designed anything yet. So have political support or public support. Is there a bike group or a neighborhood association that has been asking for crosswalks in a certain location forever? And you know, now is the time. Um, again, the public works and, and engineering um, department, make sure that they understand what this is. This is not about having a complete survey of the work and um, there should be some expectation that this is not a permanent project. So we're not doing a traffic analysis. We're not doing a heavy duty analysis of who knows what or signal timing or all these other sort of engineering related issues. If there is gonna be an issue with that, that you should strike off projects off the list, or maybe this is not for you. And then understand that as a city, you're, you're, you're on the hook for a lot in terms of support for review of the work, for approval of the drawings, um, and knowing the type of work that, that I'm showing you here, share this with your public works department and ask, can we approve stuff like this? And if the answer is no, that, that's okay. You can do another type of project. Uh, but we need to be able to approve this type of work. Um, traffic control is another one, marketing, coordination of public meeting, of a public meeting space, and more. There's other things that are not listed here, and that's all gonna come out 
uh, in our introductory conversations with you once we evaluate your projects. Uh, when you're thinking about project types, think about small scale. You're thinking about an intersection or, or a series of crosswalks or some small bicycle improvements around a small area. Could be greenway elements as well. As I said, we're, we're, we're committed to $30,000 uh, and that starts to set the, the scale. Um, and, and if you're looking for, for, for sort of um, inspiration, look at a planning process that you're already working on right now uh, that might merit a test or some sort of evaluation or uh, an existing plan that you already did or some funding that you've got coming up. I think that that's always, I like the projects that have long-term funding, like two or three years, because that gives us enough time to evaluate something real and for you all to make changes before you spend any real money. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but, and, and you can review them later in, in when you look at this presentation again, but think about practicality, really. I mean, I, I go back to frequently in, in these presentations, think about what you can do, accomplish or what a group of four or five people are gonna be able to do in a day or two. And that starts to bring your, your mind back down to earth in terms of length and, and complexity. There might be components that we hire a contractor for. So in, in that Deerfield field example, we've got um, Broward County is gonna be doing some of the striping with heavy duty machinery. And the city has some contractors that are gonna be doing some removal. So there is some heavy duty equipment that, mean, that may need to be contracted out uh, that might limit practicality. But overall, in terms of scale, think about what makes sense for, you know, at most a week and with the $30,000 budget that we've got. And we can make that, that budget stretch. So I'll, I'll say that. And, and then there are all these other sort of components. Um, is the project visible? If it's on a side street that nobody's gonna see, what's the value of that, even if it is practical? Does it improve safety? So even if it is practical, what are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Think about these questions. But retail potential, I think, is not relevant for you guys, but I, I leave it in there anyway, just because if it is on a main street or some sort of a condition like that, there is a, an economic benefit to this type of work. Um, and complexity of install. If, it, if you can't wrap your mind around how you would do it, then it's probably not a good idea. So here are just some, some quick examples I'll, I'll go through. Uh, this is not an all-inclusive list. This is just to give you a sense of scale and complexity. So here's a, a, this is a project that we did in Key West recently that was funded by the Health Foundation of South Florida, um, where you can see the existing stop bar in the foreground. I don't know if you, can you see my cursor here, Stephanie? Moving it around. Okay, so this is the existing stop bar. This intersection was laid out and, and is so large in, in a way that we were able to put a bike box without really changing around a whole lot of the striping in the intersection. You can see the yellow double line that extends out to the edge. Um, so this all worked out. This is a really easy, small project. And I can imagine something like this with a couple of other things, that's, that starts to be the scale of the work. Again, here is in, 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 uh, oh, in Key West, again, as part of, this is a part of a, a neighborhood greenway project. And I think we did something like 20 different little installations. These are chicanes or pavement markings. And our total budget for this was about $15,000. And this is traffic paint, delineators, and some traffic tape, which is a heavy duty type of tape. We could do crosswalks. This is a, a crosswalk that we just did in, in Peachtree, on Peachtree uh, Avenue in downtown Atlanta as part of a much larger project. I don't wanna show you the whole project because I don't want you to get excited and think we could do something of this scale. This had a much larger material budget. I think it was a um, hundred and, a hundred and change. And most of that was actually planters and, and planting material. So this is a, a three block stretch, but one of the, the big moves that we did was create this, um, I think 75 foot wide crosswalk in the middle of mid block in, in their middle, in the middle of the block of the project. So this is their downtown, this is their, their main street, and we took one lane in either direction and gave that over to pedestrians as a sidewalk extension. It's beautifully tree-lined, but 
added this crosswalk in the center of, of the street. It's not signalized, it's marked, but not signalized. And the size of it, I think, really um, provides that level of safety where if, if we wouldn't do this in another location on, our, on an arterial without signals, but here it made sense. And the long-term play on Peachtree is to the, the creation of a shared space. So they're, they're looking to, and, and are already actively looking for funding to create this in, in a long-term way, sort of like uh, Clamata Street in West Palm Beach recently did. But this is four lanes going down to two lanes and dot, dot, dot. But for you guys, think crosswalks, a bunch of crosswalks in a row or something like that. Intersection murals. This is another. This is an example from West Palm Beach. Some of you might know it. Um, they're on Tamarind uh, by the Dreyfus School for the Arts. This mural. I'm I'm on the fence about the intersection murals, and also the street murals. These are some of my favorite projects because they're so beautiful, but they also degrade pretty fast. So just go into it knowing that both of these projects were relatively um, affordable in terms of the cost. This is a, a scale that we can work at within the $30,000 budget and by May. Um, but like I said, they, they do fade. There's an element of, of decay that, that is inherent in this work. So just expect that if you have something like this. And the other part of this is if, we are, if, we, if you do have a location that you want to see something like this, think about how you use that space. Is it something that you can close on a regular basis for block parties? Or is it something that's already used for that purpose and you want to be able to paint it for, to, to give it that extra life or that, that other meaning? In this case, in, in Asheville, North Carolina, this is a combination of, of a bunch of different types of projects, uh, but the, a bunch of different project elements, I should say. But this block is frequently closed for open streets events. So this made sense here. Uh, for Tamarind, this was just a, a sort of traffic calming measure, and um, I know that this one they've they've done several different versions of it, and the paint hasn't looked great. Uh, when it comes to paint, we'll work with you if if there is an asphalt art component to make sure that the colors look good. Um, pinks and purples and yellows they just they look dirty fast, whereas blues don't look that bad, and 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 greens and browns look much nicer over time. Intersection repair is another project type that, that I think is appropriate for this, for this grant cycle. And that is, um, you can see here, this is from a, a, a location in Chicago called Lincoln Hub, where a bunch of streets uh, merge in, in a bizarre geometry. So we can use asphalt art. And we can also, there, there can be, we can do this without art and just have it be solid colors, if, if that's something that gives the engineers you know, anxiety. But you can see here where the curb lines used to be. And so this just, it shortens crossing distances. It reconfigures the geometry of the space to be more for pedestrians and more legible for folks. It also slows people down as they go through. We can do sidewalk extensions for short blocks. This is in downtown Miami uh, for Third Avenue. And you can see here, this is on-street parking. Um, and it's just painted. It's an easy way of expanding pedestrian space. This has become a very popular uh, tactic during COVID because city leaders realized that their sidewalks were substandard. Also, we see historically a lot of cities do this in neighborhoods where there's, there's enough asphalt space to, to be able to paint a sidewalk, but where you don't want the disruption of actually building out a sidewalk or it's just gonna be too complex. There's a lot of trees. There's, there's a lot of different reasons, but we've seen really beautiful examples in neighborhoods where you need a sidewalk for whatever reason, and we can make one by carving out of the asphalt space. And again, anything that I'm showing you here with color can be done in a solid tone if, if that helps in any way. So this is that example from, from Asheville again, where we did a, a sidewalk expansion. Um, and you can see, actually, these were just very, very large lanes in either direction that we tightened up and we gave that space back over to the sidewalk. Um, and then here, I'm gonna show the before and after. This is from Honolulu. Uh, and it could be a combination of curb extensions and sidewalk extensions at one location. You can see here, this is an arterial. We did not take any, any space away. This was just uh, sort of picking at the edges. And, and shortening the crossing distances. And then part of that also might include 
a, a pedestrian refuge in the middle of the street if that's necessary or warranted. This is a project that, that was done this year in Hermosa Beach, California. You can see there's curb extensions. We also added in the crosswalks, the yield markings, um, the signage, and the pedestrian refuge. And then there might also be some bus stop enhancements. This is, this is that project in Akron that I was mentioning earlier. So there's a two-way bike facility, um, but there's a bus stop here. So uh, the city installed a ramp as part of a, a fund that they already had. And then we, we created the TAN space for the bus, for the, basically it's a queuing area for, for bus riders. But I can imagine any number of, of bus stop enhancements um, that, that might fall under this sort of quick build methodology. And so finally, here's just a, a, a slice of some, what those materials look like. They're plastic sticks, plastic, you know, the flex post, those are, those are on the approved FDOT list. There's a lot of other great materials that are not on that list. So if there's flexibility, you're gonna get a, a more elegant looking project. Uh, I apologize that that image is not coming out. We've been using frequently, most recently, curb stops as a, as a replacement for a curbing or, or even precast curbing works very nice, looks sharp, people understand what it is. You know, planters are a possibility. And then here's how it all looks when we're actually out there working and doing the work. It's all measured and based on our plans, uh, but we do work with, with the community and with community members to, to lay it all out. Um, here's just more, more shots of work in action. Uh, it's really nothing, nothing sexy about it. It's just sometimes I think it helps folks understand and, and, and bring it back down to the human scale. We're doing this work together. You're not farming this out. If you're the project manager for this, if you're applying for this, our expectation is that we're out there together painting and measuring and directing the work. So th keep that in mind. I think that's it for me. Um, let's see, we've got some questions. Perfect, yes, we have some questions. I would like to answer the first one. Is a project required to be in the Computer Trees Master Plan Bundle area? Is one of the criteria that we uh, included as part of the prioritization of projects. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the bottom area, but you have to be aware that uh, it will have less points if it's not, you know, because it is part of the selection criteria. Uh, I, th I think most important is it is a part of an existing plan uh, uh, from the city. It's part of an existing study. It's a, it's a part of any upcoming uh, projects that will be programmed. Right. That's the most important uh, question here. But I would say, I would say, Stephanie, that mm -hmm. if there's a good project that doesn't mm -hmm. comply with that, don't be shy about submitting it, mm -hmm. and we'll evaluate it. And and if we all think like that's a really great project, it's not in the bundle area, but gosh, this is going to be a successful project, we'll consider it. So don't don't be shy about that. Yeah, don't be shy. It's one of the criteria. Uh, but I think if you can add information about what the city is doing towards, uh, including this project in a, in a future plan, or is it already you know, part of a community request? You know, that's the information that you should add in the description of the project. That is also right. part of the, the, the application. You know, try to justify why is this project so important for the city and for the community. Right. Then we have a, another question. Uh, is your in your experience, how long does the paint normally maintain itself until it needs to be removed or repainted? You know, that's a really good question. And it depends if it's being driven over on a regular basis or not. And if it's in, and if it occurs, if, if the paint occurs at a location um, where water accrues regularly or where there's debris from trees, uh, I would say that you're going to get you know, a couple years out of the paint, it's it's never going to look like this image on on the on the screen that I'm showing. Is this from Providence, Rhode Island? It'll never look that good beyond the first week or two because it gets dirty. And in Providence, you know, you've got snow and and just dirt happens. But you're going to get a couple years out of it with it looking okay. And it'll 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 look dirty over time. A, a lot of places go back and repaint, and they make that a a community effort, you know, it's just a, another painting day to, to get another year out of the work. In front of Coral Gables City Hall, for example, they've got um, some artistic crosswalks that were installed 
five years ago and they've come back in a couple times and they look really sharp. I think the last time they did it was two years ago and they still look really good. And this last time they applied sealant. There's things that we can do to, to prolong the longevity mm -hmm. of the paint. That's, that was a great answer. So we have another question. Will, will you obtain BCTED with Broward County, right? Permits for the temp pavement marking. So we actually work with Broward County. You know, they are part of our committee meetings. They are since day one a, helping us coming up with these designs. So yes, they are part of it. And yeah, they are part of the team. They are. So yeah, they we are, have to yeah. consider that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that goes to project selection. Mm -hmm. If if mm -hmm. you know, if your city engineer is willing to, and this is what we've learned through Broward County is if your city engineer is willing to sign off on something, they're they'll go for it. They'll go along with it. Mm -hmm. Um knowing that it's a temporary project and they do have some general guidelines that were very helpful but i found that the city engineer for deerfield was more conservative than than broward was um so take that into account when you're choosing your project yes then we have another question paint questions okay on sidewalks uh, are there any ada issues with visibility what about the stormwater runoff environmental issues? Um, I'm not crazy about paint, paint on sidewalks. I don't really think that there's a necessity for that. The reason we do paint and the reason we do projects like this is to reconfigure geometries that are hostile to pedestrians. The sidewalk is the pedestrian zone already, so I don't like to waste you know, effort on the sidewalk. Um, with regard to ADA issues and visibility, one of the things that we can work on is maintaining, uh, for example, if we're working on a curb extension that has a crosswalk, um, we can mark out the edge of where the, the path is with the white lines with re retro reflectivity. We take that on a case by case, uh, but typically we'll leave the crosswalk um, lines, the, the pavement markings alone. We don't cover them. Um, we leave them exactly where they are. When it comes to stormwater and runoff, uh, I'm not sure if this, what this is referring to other than there's one issue is during implementation, uh, we have to make sure that the street is dry. Um, and if the location is one where water accumulates, that's not great for, for asphalt art just because the pavement is so porous. It, it's gonna have, it's very hard to dry it. And if there's water in the pavement already, it doesn't cure, the paint doesn't cure properly. Other than that, these are um, water-based paints uh, that they, they don't just come off because of, of rain or, or mm -hmm. um, it's not tempera paint. It's not just washing away after a day. Um, yes, and for this specific pilot project, we want the break to be on, on, on site for at least six months. So have that in mind. So we're using a semi-permanent type of paint. And of course, it has to be approved by city staff. Uh, then another question from the city of Pompano. Can a city submit several proposals? Yes, you can submit several proposals. Just make sure to justify each of them and include the information that we are requesting. Then we have another question. Has a pilot project ever been so good that permanent materials haven't been used to replace the temporary materials? Benjamin, that's a good question. I I can't think of one. Um, I know, I mean, whether it's good or not is, is in the eye of the beholder, but more often than not, I find that, that the projects that stay in the ground stay there because there's no funding for the next step, not because they were just so amazing. Um, I'd have to think about that there. I mean, there are a lot of really great examples from New York City um, where, for example, in the Garment District in New York, they have a street that um, that they do asphalt art on on a regular basis, and it's just a rotating canvas. And so that's it. It's not. I guess that's that is the permanent project. It's just it, it's an it's a tactical urbanism project that they don't really intend to redo that street because they get more more value out of it as a canvas. So that that is one example. But otherwise. Um, you see a lot of bus lanes that are just the the tactical version ends up being the permanent version. Um, 
But the temporary materials are not, they're not long lasting. So even if say it's, it's a bus lane and we do it in, in, in you know, traffic paint, those bus tires, they just tear up that paint in, in, in a short amount of time. So you go to MMA or to, to thermoplastic, it always leads to something else. That's a really good question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna noodle on that. <laughs> then we have another question and this is coming from mayor of the city of Fort Lauderdale, Mayor Seattle. Who selects the materials and pattern of project? Okay, the materials, it, it's a combination. So half of it is the city engineer and whether they want us to stick with the FDOT approved list of materials. Half of it is the budget and the other half is our judgment about the materials that work and don't work. Also, the other half of it, which we're at 200% now, if you notice, the other half is, what is, your, what is your objective? Do you want it to be shorter term? So in the range of, of what Stephanie just said, we want it to be in the ground for at least six months. But if you want it to be in the ground longer, then instead of using traffic paint, we can spec out uh, uh, an MMA, which is an epoxy type of material, which will last much longer. So there's a combination of, of, of decisions that go into that. So if we have $30,000 and you all bring money and you say, look, we want this in the ground for a year at least or more, we want to use the highest quality materials, then we'll spec that out. And then that, that'll determine the, the materials. The pattern, if you're talking about the art itself, there's a bunch of different ways we can go about that. Um, we frequently do the art. I, I consider myself an artist for what it's worth. Uh, so a lot of the, the work that we do is, um, you know, is just inspired internally. We will ask the community for their guidance on, on themes. So there could be a thematic survey or a, a theme workshop that asks what are the ideas and the, the sort of the themes and the icons that are most re relevant to you. Or we can convene a, a workshop with students or, or the community and ask them for their own sketches. Or we can um, convene a, a group of, of artists that are local and, and have them do a competition. There's so, so many different ways of arriving at the art. Yes, I think it depends on the city's approach, what exactly the city and the community wants, and we can be flexible to you know, how we uh, prepare these uh, designs. Right. Right. Given, given the fact that, we, that we've got basically five to six months to do this, mm -hmm. I err on the side of, of a shorter process. If we had more time, we, can, we could do a more involved sort of artist selection process and RFP and all that, um, but we don't have that time. So that should, take, that should be taken into account. Yes, and those are the type of requests that we are expecting in the kickoff meeting. So if you already have a plan on an idea, bring it to the kickoff meeting so we can start working in December. Yeah. And then we have uh, a, from the city of Oakland Park, one, a, a, a raised hand. I don't know, Rebecca, if we can allow them to, to speak. Let me check. Uh, I think we can promote to panelists. Let's see. Uh, so Jennifer, I think whenever you have a moment to speak. Okay, so it seems. Okay, let's see. Okay. So there are no any other raised hands or any other questions. I think we are uh, ready uh, to finalize the webinar. Again, if you have any other requests or specific questions before submitting your uh, so, uh, project, uh, please uh, just contact me. I will just share again my contact information. Yes, please just uh, send me an email, call me and we can set up an appointment so we can talk about your project before you're submitting your project. Remember the deadline to submit your project is November 15. After that, we will start the, the uh, criteria evaluation and then we will go on field visits in order to understand what exactly is happening in the area. And we will uh, also request meetings 
with you in order to understand even better, you know, what, what exactly is your idea. And after that, you will receive uh, a, an update uh, the, by the first week of December. So you will know if you were, your brain was selected or not. But uh, thank you everyone for your questions, your great feedback and uh, yes, take care. And again, contact me if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Tony, for thank such you. a great presentation. Bye guys. <laughs> Bye.